Thank you so much, Stephanie, and thank you for joining us for this panel. You know, this panel, I, I have a whole preamble here that I was ready to deliver, but I don't think I'm going to go with the preamble. I think I'm just going to almost repeat what I just said to the panelists out the back. And that is, in my role as the curator for Encounters for Art Basel, in my fourth year, I've been very lucky to collaborate with Stephanie Bailey. And it's such a great joy to catch up with Stephanie and Louise Oram several times a year when I'm in Hong Kong and we're both working in the office at Art Basel to talk about preparations for the next edition and both of us will be working towards 2019 very shortly. And, you know, every time Stephanie and I catch up, we talk about things like what is actually happening in the world, you know, and those things include um, conflicts of interest. Those things include self-censorship. Those things, particularly in the past six months for us, included the ramifications and realization of the implications of Me Too, of a kind of complicity around structures and systems of authority and power in the art world that operate in a way that is almost free of ethics, a kind of silencing, in a sense, of what is actually the real terms of reference in a sector or sort of space of production and presentation in which we are all often complicit in institutions and structures or organizations through reaffirming antiquated systems of silencing what is actually happening. We allow conflicts of interest, we allow the riptides and currents of corruption at times and also conflict of interest to determine the direction of things we say are not that at all. I'm not saying it's all the time, and I'm not saying it's everywhere, but to varying degrees at all levels of the art world, there are these points at which we have conflict. And we really need to think about the space in which we work. What does actual accountability, responsibility, and ethical leadership look like in the visual arts in the 21st century? And how can we, when we work in institutions or positions where we can wage or affect change, how do we do that effectively for a greater good? And can we do that without having ramifications for ourselves? And, you know, that's really the question. A lot of people protect themselves and will stay silent or bury the things that have happened behind closed doors because why would you err uh, dirty laundry when you've worked so hard to achieve an outcome? But sometimes it's really important to talk about what goes wrong as well as what goes right. And sometimes the right thing to do is to speak about the complexity that lies between the way in which we produce spaces for audiences to encounter artists and ideas and the way in which we work within our institutions, collaborations, partnerships and communities. So there has been a kind of a cry to arms in a sense. There is a necessity for things to change. And change really begins through effective change leadership. And, you know, something that... Um, Stephanie and I wanted to do, we call this panel Real Talk, Power and Complicity, because we don't want the panelists to present the status quo. We don't want them to just repeat hyperbole of the things they've done and congratulate themselves for their achievements and, you know, here's what we did and that's great, it's all worked out, nothing to see here. You know, it's, that's not going to help. It's, but at the same time, we have to be responsible. We're not going to be libelous or vilifying people. There's no need for scurrilous gossip or kind of speculation that sits outside the terms of reference. But how can we speak about what is difficult in no uncertain terms in order to make a space for these important conversations to occur where they should occur, which is not just behind closed doors, but also in public? So with that in mind, Annette's looking at me going, oh, goodness gracious, we've just met. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing for me with this panel, <laughs> no, I know. The interesting thing with this panel is that I actually, the panel before, which I just chaired, I knew everybody very well, and with every single one of the participants here, we've only just met about. I've only met them three minutes ago, so they were chosen by Stephanie and Laura, and um, you know, really wanting and Louise to really draw out some concerns and ideas. I'm not going to introduce their biographies because that's what Google is for. Um, but, you know, 
I will say that, um, you know, Stephanie gave them an introduction before, but what I've asked them each to do today is to present a three-minute positioning statement in relationship to a series of questions and propositions that myself and Stephanie prepared to send through to the panel about two weeks ago. So we will be showing images on a loop, which are really just to operate as a kind of way of adding texture to the discussion, rather than literally speaking directly to those images. We're going to do the three-minute presentations or positioning kind of statements from each of the panelists, and then we're going to have an in-conversation. But this conversation is nothing if it's not a conversation with all of you as well. So if you have questions, I please ask you to prepare them, and let's not be apprehensive about putting up our hands when the time comes to have a robust discussion together. So with that, on my list of speakers, I had Oje to kick off um, with the first presentation, and she is the Public Programs Lead at Asia Art Archive, Hong Kong. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you, Alexia and Stephanie and Louise for the invitation. I'm very excited to be part of this very um, difficult panel, I have to say. And, and I guess I would like to, to start the discussion by introducing a couple of questions around ownership. Um, and ownership of artworks, ownership of archives, um, and ownership of um, collections. Um, as Stephanie mentioned, I'm currently um, overseeing the public programs of Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong. And before I joined the team uh, last summer, I was co-running uh, an art-for-profit space in Istanbul called Collector Space. Uh, we had a very small team, only two people. Uh, we had a very small space, only 20 square uh, meters. But we had an ambition question in mind, and the, the question was, what is the responsibility of a private collector towards artworks, towards um, artists, and towards the, the general public? And over time, uh, we became much more interested in different type of ownership models in the arts. So we collaborated with collectors who considered themselves as uh, more than traditional owners of artworks. They considered themselves or identified as caretakers or facilitators or producers more than traditional owners. Um, and I guess I have to add that um, Gezi Park protest in 2013, they also helped me a lot to think about those questions, the sense of publicness that we assign to artworks or to, to collections. Because uh, we were literally one minute away from what happened. Uh, and for me, the park wasn't public because it was accessible or because it was um, occupied by people, but because people transformed the park. They uh, initiated community gardens. They initiated things that would require the participation of so many different people. Um, in the, the days to come, knowing that it would get destroyed. Um, so I think it, uh, these are some of the, the questions that I'm bringing from Istanbul to Hong Kong, and I think I'm personally very excited to further develop those questions with the, the team at Asia Art Archive, because you might be familiar with the organization. We um, primarily work on research collections, so we identify um, individual um, archives of artists or art historians, and we digitize them, and we make them public. So we make them accessible online on the website. But does it make us a public institution? Um, there's a question mark there, because the, the whole idea would be um, to turn the, the conversation upside down, and rather than expecting institutions to become transparent, accountable, um, and you know, all of these words, you know, why don't we switch the conversation to users themselves? How do users become part of institutional building? Um, and I think that's um, one of the, the major questions that we are trying to deal with. But I have to say that you can also call me a naive person, and, um, because when we think about those issues, ownership, sense of ownership, sense of belonging, they don't necessarily translate that easily to, to the real world or to, to private collections, for instance. And I guess this is where uh, I really want to say that there is a real need that we cultivate the understanding of the urgency of not-for-profit institutions. I mean, individuals uh, making more effort or putting more resources, more energy into this not-for-profit sector that is relatively independent, where we can discuss these issues and we can think about artistic commons and public commons. And I think I'll end up with this very serious sentence up there. <laughs> 
I think there's something really important you raised there, which I want to come back to, because I come from the not-for-profit and independent and constala space myself. And that is really, we establish institutions with a lot of hope. And we set them up with a lot of hard work, and sometimes we don't want to have the difficult conversations about what something is to become through time. And once something moves from being an idea to an institution, what are its particular sets of behaviors, what are its responsibilities, and how does an organization like a not-for-profit really maintain independence when it has to rely on self-generating and diversifying income from both public and private sources, and what is the role of a not-for-profit or independent space in truly being independent when you are working within a complicated set of requirements which increasingly scaffold the ambition of an institution. And I think that's a big one as well coming out of Turkey. I did a, a panel like this similarly with, uh, with Saha, with Merva, and talked about a number of these things. And I do think it is sometimes from crisis that we actually get the greatest clarity. You know, and it's important to talk about this. So it will be great to come back to that. Um, the next person I would like to go to is Fula. Uh, he is the founder and artistic director of the Lagos Biennial 2017 and is based between Lagos and Berlin. Thank you. Um, my submission will be quite personal, and I think I'll be talking about my, my practice as primarily an artist and now having to wear the hat um, of a curator and uh, just following the first edition of uh, the, the Lagos Biennial, I won this curatorial residency in Germany to investigate the city for a whole year. And I wouldn't say I've totally immersed myself into that position of curator because um, three, four, five years ago, I was that artist who used to point the finger at the curator for, you know, this power play in, you know, in art or in contemporary art. And I like that this um, panel is, is tagged um, Real Talk. And this was, was real for me because I think if, if I never delved into curating, if I never turned my, my studio back in Lagos into an art space, I wouldn't be sitting on this seat right now. So like four years ago, um, it was just like this epiphany, like if I keep making art and hoping that someday some artists would discover me, you know, already being at a disadvantage in, this might sound vague, but in Africa, for example, where you have in every 10 years, there are probably 15, 20 artists who make it to the global stage and nobody gives a damn about any other person doing any other thing. There are probably, say in Lagos, two, three curators that are the go-to people. And I'm sitting there and like, does this mean that my career, my life is left to chance? And so you have other artists like me beginning to convert their studios into art spaces. And so in 2013, I got all my, like, my art, my studio materials, my tools, my paint, chisels, everything, and then built this massive space uh, in, in wood and nailed all my materials into the ceiling. So I'm not touching this thing until I figure out what this contemporary art thing is. Because in art school, you study every art movement, there's some style, there's some technique, there's an ideology, and it adds up and you can see you know, what leads to what. But it gets really vague when you get to contemporary art. And I begin to perceive that you know, this is probably not a period in time for art, because you know, as we all know, art in in the 17th century was contemporary to the people of, those, of that time. And maybe this is just um, an art structure of institutionalized art or you know, where the art institution takes more prominence than the art or the artist you know, who makes the work. So in my practice now, you know, wearing both hats and trying to navigate both spaces and being this humane person who can talk to 40 artists to come to Lagos for a biennial without paying for their tickets and 
they just believe that you know this is transparent, this is honest, and we want to do this to be able to make our statements or um, show our work to the wall without any inhibition. And we know we're not getting anything out of this, but we will do this in a sense for you because we trust you as one of us, but at the same time to open up this space and open up this conversation like, you know, nobody's saying there's a problem or like curators are bad people. But how about we try it another way? How about we create new platforms? And so in, in calling uh, or in tagging uh, the event a biennial, it wasn't exactly from like a state or nationalistic thing that, yeah, Lagos now has a biennial. It was more of subversion. Like, you know, we'll do this and nobody really can do anything about this because it wasn't state funded, it wasn't funded by you know, some art institution anywhere. It was just a bunch of artists opening up this space and the results were phenomenal. Yeah. I think you raise, again, some really important points for all of that, which are to do with when you create structures for yourself, you know, there's a responsibility that is assumed. And I think, you know, we've seen with a proliferation of biennials globally and regionally, a kind of crisis emerge around resources and ambition. And when you have a level of transparency about what you have from the outset and then can work collaboratively to achieve something larger than you could do on your own. I think there's also a really important question there, which is two questions there, which is how long can you rely on the resources of artists to build the infrastructure necessary for independent and critical ideas to flourish outside of a kind of dominant set of structures of power. You spoke before about gatekeeper culture, and I think, you know, when we think 10 or 15 years ago back in the region, the idea of globalization and the art world was that the edges would become the center and the center would become the edges and we'd all live in like this kind of very kind of kumbaya culture of equitable access and easy distribution and mobility and movement and the global art world relies on travel, which is expensive. And, you know, how do we actually form these other economies? That's not what happened. And in our local context, we've had to look at rebuilding new infrastructure and spaces for art to actually have a different kind of spirit against a dominant kind of refrain. And it was really interesting to hear you speak about that transition, making a decision from being an artist to a curator and the responsibility that comes when you take on the mantle of then being, you know, determining spaces for art and for ideas and that idea of institutions that foreground art and ideas ahead of the institution. So it will be great to unpack that further. Um, the next person I would like to go to is to Matthew. And Matthew, you are an artist from Hong Kong, currently presenting in the public projects along the foreshore. Hi. <coughs> Hi. Yes, uh, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Matthew. Today, I'm very happy and honored to be at this conversation session. Um, in fact, I am a new joiner. Um, in fact, because of my piece, before collapse, uh, then I uh, was then known by many people. Now this piece is about the development and constant explosion of the uh, the constant expansion of the world, and then what will happen next. So this artwork at the same time reflects my feeling and sense of um, helplessness when I face the world. I feel that I am fragile. So this sense of fragility. Now as an uh, artist, when you create your Works. It is difficult to find resources, so we try to seek a subsidy or assistance from various organizations. But when it comes to financial assistance from different organizations, they usually impose many conditions. The supporting organizations will have their own stance and positions or conditions. Or goals. So how can we 
satisfy their goals in our works. This is difficult because there may be some elements that are not suitable to you. So how do you um, make a decision on give and take or compromise? Now recently, there is a Hong Kong movie that was just uh, awarded. Um, at the Tokyo Film Festival, uh, an outstanding film. And then that director had once applied to the Hong Kong Film Development Fund, but then his application was declined. The reason was that there were not enough commercial elements in the film. At that time, uh, this director wondered himself that if there would be enough commercial elements in his film, then why would he need any financial assistance? So without financial assistance, how did he complete the production of the film? In fact, most members of the film production crew did not get paid. And I was very curious at that time. I didn't understand why that film did not get any financial assistance. So I looked for information about the Hong Kong Film Development Fund. I wanted to understand what their goals are. Now, this fund seeks to um, give financial assistance to train and develop talents. These are very broad brush projects here. And one interesting point is they would like to enhance promotion of Hong Kong films overseas and in mainland China. The content of this film is about the 1997 riots in Hong Kong and also some issues related to social movements. Now, this is a rather sensitive uh, topic, so perhaps uh, you then can understand why uh, they were not able to get financial assistance. I would like to cite from Julie Hoser's work, Money Creates Taste. So if you have money or if you have power to build some systems, then these systems will actually um, limit um, the emergence of some artworks. At the same time, your creative autonomy will also be affected. So I think that this issue is worth further thinking. So it's a matter of how you use your money and power. Well, if you have seen my piece, I think the location is quite interesting. The position is very interesting. Well, the X are made of charcoal, and then there are the government complex and IFC surrounding my piece. And then these buildings actually symbolize money and power, and my work is being surrounded by all these buildings. So, between money, power, and art, what is the relationship? What is really happening? When we face power, I think everybody may become weak. But in the example that I just cited, in fact, many people still insist on their principles and uh, mentality. So in that way, then the power of art can be sustained. Just a few minutes for the translation to complete. I think it's a really potent image, your work, Matthew, located down there. And something I was speaking about with Stephanie earlier was the fact that there's only a few Hong Kong artists included in that presentation. And I think there's something about an art world that is artist-funded. You know, there are people who have the resources, and I think that question about using power and money effectively and conscientiously and responsibly through time to achieve more than just sort of... Um, heavyweight monuments to one's own ambition, but something more lasting is a really important question to ask. And what is the role and responsibility of funding agencies that can operate at arm's length from systems or structures of the politics within, with 
upon which they are actually embedded or established. And that's an interesting one. I think we see example after example of self-censorship that occurs when we put forward ideas in order to seek a diversification of revenue for artists to be enabled to achieve works at a level of ambition with political intent, but also we see the capitulating or the denial of what these works can actually achieve in creating a kind of richer dialogue about what things are. So there's some good questions there about who gets to make decisions, why, how, and for who. And with that, I think the next speaker is Xiao Yu. And Zhao Yu is the Associate Curator of Chinese Art, the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation, Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum, New York. We love all these initials. <laughs> Thank you, Alexine, Thank um, you. For, the, uh, uh, for the introduction. Um, I think I'm not going to talk too much about my work or what I do today, as we mentioned earlier, but as a curator from a foreign country living in the United States, working there and also in New York, um, there have been quite a few waves of very complicated events that in the art and cultural sector in the past year or so. Um, and uh, I actually wanted to speak from very also personal perspective in terms of, and personal experience in terms of how I respond and trying to have a grasp onto the situation. Um, first of all, I actually saw an image of the power come as no surprise um, in this slide, and um, uh, abuse of power come as no surprise. So for some of you might know or might not know, um, it is a initiative uh, started by a group of women artists um, in addressing issues of uh, abuse of a power in the art world and sexual harassment as um, one specific uh, proposition that in the visual arts sector in connection with all the other bigger issues in the entertainment world and uh, political world. Um, I actually worked um, voluntarily and translated the letter from English to Chinese and the, uh, it, the, the, the letter has been translated into different languages and it's all available on the internet of, of the uh, petition. Um, I, when I first got the invitation to do it, I actually feel a second of um, I feel intimidated. I didn't know if I should say yes or no. Um, and uh, we did sign the name, um, and also we kind of acknowledged identity as who are, have been working in pushing these through. Um, so there was a moment of thinking about these bigger consequences that you're on the one hand representing certain institution, on the other hand um, you might know or had connection with um, some of the individuals that are involved into in the, these issues, and also, uh, like I said, as a woman and a foreigner working in a country that you're in a not very privileged place, to um, have some of the certain kind of actions that you take, but. This kind of feeling, I think, is very much shared by many of my colleagues, um, especially maybe younger and emerging colleagues. Um, I have to say that with the moving forward of the movement, I feel quite empowered and being able to share all this experience with the fellow curators. I a few weeks before I came here, um, I went to a workshop at the New Museum in New York where the topic was to talk about uh, e salary uh, equality in the workplace for women curators and artists versus the male curators and artists. Um, it's, it's a very interesting experience. However, with that said, I'm not so convinced, I'm uh, very skeptical in terms of the violence that are also generated through the platform of the internet, uh, especially the series of uh, actions of trolling and punishment, um, venting on the internet towards individual and towards organizations. That lead me to, um, I put a few slides of another few other incidents in New York where artworks got sent Answered, um, in various museums and the um, event itself 
was accelerated through the de debate and discussion and petition and trolling on the internet. Um, so that is leading to a much bigger issue that we could discuss about uh, of freedom of speech and also sort of the idea of democracy and how that is being flattened and simplified in some of these cases. So I see it as a quite complex um, thing. Um, and um, yeah, last but not least, also a few, maybe a little bit about my work um, at the Guggenheim is specifically working with artists from China, uh, greater China, and also um, um, disseminate their work, new commissions in foreign American or international audience. Um, I have to constantly addressing this issue of the European canon and how to put them in an oppositional position as we're fighting for a certain recognition. Um, but I think this is also something that we need to switch our ways of thinking a little bit as how can we get rid of the idea of endorsing uh, or celebrating what we do, but to prom problematizing it and to put it on the table for discussion. Um, but of course, this idea of the European Canaan is not only an academic advantage, but it's deeply entrenched with the power and wealth. Um, so that's another much bigger topic to... It's, it's good. <laughs> this is going to make Stephanie really happy. <laughs> but I do think you do raise a very important point there about vigilantism and about kind of renegade reprisals and the ability of firestorms to emerge through social media platforms that can vilify people. But there's also the important question, I think, that's been raised through the Me Too kind of revelations about borderline pathological behavior, which sits just shy of being libelous or litigious, just shy of prosecution. And how can you determine in an art world where we all have relationships with each other, we, we eat together, we drink together, we travel together, we're often moving in and out of social networks and relationships with one another, there is blurred boundaries. But what are the distinctions and boundaries and how do you actually define what is actually, or how do you work off what is a one-off lapse of judgment where someone makes a decision in poor taste that impacts the individual agency or rights of someone else and when are you actually dealing with someone who is a serial predator sexual predator or bully and how can you distinguish between the two and the kind of culture that they create around them because they know that what they do just falls this side of the law and I do also think that sort of also echoes with what you were saying about the canon in a sense they're a doubling it's just sitting shy of what can seem like a silencing of particular positions. So on that point, it would be great to go to you, Annette. And Annette is the Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Artesia AG, Zurich, Los Angeles, and Hong Kong. So I'm obviously the oddball here. <laughs> and I would like to actually take that on the discussion on a different level, on a more macro um, level. Um, because I do think, since we're in Asia here, the biggest shift that's happened in the art world is the emergence of Asia, as you said. And I, in my perspective, that power shift, shift is extremely positive, and it's inspiring to see how differently Asia views and deals with art, and how they are much more playful less orthodox, not to the enjoyment to some of the players, as you were very politely pointing to of their European canon. Um, but I do think it brings a different perspective to the art world, and there is actually no right or wrong structure to the art world, and we should celebrate that and enjoy it. It also comes, we have to be honest, it comes in areas, and you, Matthew, had a very um, clear point on that. It comes with, um, in some areas of um, Asia, also with the approach of art as a product. And that's just a reality. If we like that or not, it's a reality, and it will likely continue. 
And we can just hope that the power structure in the future will have many layers, meaning there is within the art world, there's different areas of that. So there are the nonprofit institutions, there are artists on all kinds of um, levels in that. But we also have to acknowledge that there is the art world is today also a global market. And that comes with a certain power structure. We do see things happening in the art world that you see in many other markets, which means there are global brands. <laughs> if you go to uh, H. Queen's building, you know exactly what I'm talking about. They're stacked up on top of each other. <laughs> In that building, that is the global power structure here. Hong Kong is a bit more direct in that. They just stack him in one building. In every other city, they're around the place. And I think we just have to realize that and acknowledge there are certain big changes in terms of power shift in the art world. The one that I mentioned is Asia. The other one is that in many markets around the world, we see the, what's called the middle market. So everything that's in the middle, the mid-sized galleries, artists who are just moving up, that's where it is most challenging. I think when you start, like you explained with your Lagos Biennale, there is still opportunities around there. I think the challenging part is between the global market and the grassroots, where we currently see it is actually diminishing and going away, which would be sad. And one thing that might actually, in my view, bring hope to the art world, but the art world hasn't quite been able to get access to that, is new money today is generated in the tech world. And that is generated in all over Asia in the tech world and is generated in the West in the tech world. These people have a very different view on the art world. They cannot understand, which goes back to power and complicity, they cannot understand why are the prices what the prices are. Why do you say this is the value is X? There's no data around that. So I think that will be a huge opportunity, especially for, for, in a way, democratizing the art world. If data would be available about art across the market and an understanding. Somebody told me today she bought, and I'm not going to say who the artist was, she bought an art piece two years ago for 5,000 something euros. And she wanted to buy a second one from that artist um, this week. And now it is 300 times that price. And there was no, she said, you know, I'm perfectly willing to potentially pay that, but I need to understand why. <laughs> what kind of development was either in the artist's journey in between or in the perception of the market of the artist to be willing um, to do that. So I think data can bring a lot of transparency around that and it can actually help also artists to get um, recognition. I think what also is likely going to happen if you look at there is an intransparency in the market, as I just started to describe. And since the market is getting bigger, at some point, there will be some kind of regulation coming to the market. Currently, we only see two markets around the world where there's no regulation. One is cryptocurrencies, and the other one is the art world. And I do think that a certain amount of regulation might also help to get what I heard around this a lot, a different approach to how the art market recognizes a broader set of positions, not just driven um, by 
the brand. Another element that we can see currently is, which is another driver of change, I believe, is around the world we can see cities have been heavily focusing on the art world with less or more success. But it shows you that there is a demand for art, some say as excuse, other people say it's as inspiration for um, people. Some say, you know, Hong Kong is, it also depends on the DNA of a city. You know, Hong Kong is, in its essence, a trader's place. It's always been from its history. And that's, of course, the overarching approach it also takes to art. That might be shocking to some people. Um, also on this panel, I already know. Um, but I think it's a reality, and it's not good or bad. The question is, does we have enough diversity so that all the different positions that can be taken in the art world have a point? And these are not final thoughts. They're basically arguments to steer a debate, because I'm sure, I know that on this panel there's some very controversial, <laughs> she's already looking at me, <laughs> controversial positions to that, but I think that is the interesting part, and I think that also should be interesting to get very um, interesting questions and positions from the audience. Absolutely. And I think you have an interesting point about data and what data can do. And there was an interesting study done by the National Association for the Visual Arts, which looked at the average annual income of an artist across the UK, North America and Australia. And the average annual income of an artist is $10,287. Art Basel Basel last year turned over $4.7 billion of sales in five days. We're operating at different sets of economy in the art world, and we're talking about several different things when we speak about how we compare one construct to another. And it's really not easy to just kind of put those juxtapositions next to each other because it's unsettling for a range of reasons. And I think there's a question that I really want to get to with the questions that I had for you. And I would like to use the questions I had prepared, particularly with Matthew on the panel, so that it's easier to be responsive. But I want to ask a question about what happens when art is used as an asset class or tool for the development and branding of cities or regions and countries? And what is the distinction between art in the civic or cultural space and art as part of the capital or entertainment economy. Can I hand over to someone, maybe before Annette, another one of the panelists who might want to pick up some of those ideas about the idea of when art is instrumentalized as an asset class? Perhaps, Fola, would you have some thoughts? Okay, I'll speak, uh, of course, with respect to the Lagos Biennial. <laughs> Naturally. With great respect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I think I clearly stated in the, the previous session I was in that, you know, it, it wasn't an initiative by, by the government. It was something a bunch of artists got together and said, hey, let's do this. And as such, there wasn't like a touristic... Um, uh, motivation to things. It wasn't like we were trying to get more people to visit the country. It was more of giving a voice to the society through the artists and their engagement with um, the space which we chose as a venue, which was this huge community in this railway compound on the screen. And um, it's, I mean, a lot of the art was hugely political and addressing issues that people um, talk about in harsh tones but would never really say in public for um, fear of being um, targeted by, by the government. And while we understand that uh, these same issues resonate in other parts of the world, um, we wanted to sample two things, um, our parallel histories with other countries in the West African region and uh, counter-narratives with you know, artists from 
anywhere else who had similar issues or similar uh, narratives and will place that on the background of Lagos, like a green screen. Or, you know. And um, it, it sort of set the tone for what the biennial will be. And for the next edition already, the um, curators who, who are in charge, um, they, they already get that feeling that, you know, this is not something to promote the city. Um, uh, we had initial problems with the government funding because they wanted us to take off a picture that um, is on one of my slides. You will see this picture with a statue. Uh, it was um, a structure built by returnee slaves um, who were this Brazilian community on the Lagos Island. And it was listed as a national monument about 40 years ago. And the family who owned it never got compensation for it. So about two years ago, uh, they sold it to a developer who pulled down this building. And it caused um, a lot of debate. And people were really upset that this building that held so much history will be pulled down. And the biennial decided to use this uh, image as its poster uh, to show the um, deliberate effort in which we were going to investigate our history through uh, our space, through architecture, through a lot of structures that I like to refer to as relics. Because, I mean, apart from our colonial history with all the architecture that we see from Britain, from Portugal, from Brazil, there's also um, a, a sour taste of all our military regimes that have left massive... Uh, capital projects just abandoned um, back in the 80s when the capital of Nigeria was moved from Lagos to Abuja. So you have massive structures that are just empty. So the, the idea was to investigate uh, the country's history through the spaces. So I don't know what the future holds, but for me, tourism just doesn't cut it. It's not, um, it's, the, the binary is more like a, like a vent. Yeah. I think that's a really great word, vent, and having these opportunities for alternate or parallel narratives to emerge through new structures and systems that can be created from the ground up, not just the top down. But, you know, Matthew, you live in Hong Kong and work in Hong Kong, and when Fulham mentions the instrumentalizing of a handful of artists in a local context to represent an entire community, or he speaks to the way that images are appropriated for other forms of visual communication through either government or other authorities or entities. What is art in a cultural or civic space for you? And when you think about the change in Hong, the changes in Hong Kong over the past five to ten years, how do you describe the space in relationship to systems and structures of power locally and globally and what that actually means? That was a big question. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> ten <laughs> of them. <laughs> yes, it's really <laughs> huge. <laughs> I think, first of all, I agree that art should happen from bottom up because you can't set a framework on top and then tell the city to come up with certain art forms or art pieces because many things should be based on the local culture and the local people. What do they want for themselves? In Hong Kong, actually, my feeling is, in the past, we had plenty of art space, like Oil Street, which were initiatives by local artists. Today, the government took over the management and also cattle deep. You can see the level of vibrancy and energy is reducing. If you look at what came from the community itself, it's more vibrant, it's more energetic. It carries more local characteristics because every place carries importance in the art form. It carries its own life and its own elements. It's very local, it's truly local. It's not like any exhibition somewhere else. And I believe from the artist's perspective. I think 
如果你講唔同嘅藝術類型，係絕對可以有。你可以有一啲誒教生嘅嘢，亦都可以教係純藝術嘅嘢，或者係一啲令即係其實其實係唔同嘅嘢咯。So, 我會覺得即係喺喺市場度賣緊嘅嘅一啲藝術品，同你去探到一萬以上藝術品嗰啲係可能係同一個價值冇關係。即係其實其實個。以金錢嚟講，但係喺文化上嘅價值好重要。咁嗰樣嘢點樣量化？其實你你唔可以喺誒市場度量化嗰件事。咁變咗嗰個，亦都係好重要嘅喺我哋嘅角度。咁咁其實我我覺得兩個系統嘅運作，咁唔係衝突嘅。咁嗰樣嘢係互相都會發生嘅事。咁嗰樣嘢係互相都會發生嘅事。咁嗰樣嘢係互相都會發生嘅事。Show you. I've been watching you shake your head as Matthew gave his answer, sort of nodding in agreement to some extent. It looked like, but also some form, some thoughts of your own forming. Can I just get your impressions on that series of comments? Yeah, sure. I would just want to follow up with what Matthew just said. I think、um, we cannot conflate. Ideas of the art world and the art market, in the sense that, also, if we are turning to data, that's a very interesting dilemma we're trapped ourselves in. Is we're using technology to control us or control the art world, not or control art. I think science, technology, and art should coexist and be in a different dynamic, and then use one way to measure the other, or vice versa.、Um, and I also had this very. Uh, I guess entrenched experience with this obsessed of getting tech money in the art world. Because before I moved to New York, I spent eight years in San Francisco, right next to the Silicon Valley. So perhaps before the world awakened to thinking where the tech money goes, the art world awakened thinking where the tech money goes. The local art community in San Francisco has been struggling. For years, and trying to understand first of all why the rent has increasing like crazy. Second of all, why nobody supports the local,、um, you know, community of art, the local sustainability of art produce of art production and artist. And here, I also just I don't. Of course, I don't have any any like concrete answer or anything. But I want to just throw out a question. If we only consider art as product, then what's the difference between, let's say, Elon Musk's boring company versus Tanya Bergara's piece talking about Cuba? We cannot like put these things in in equal、um, position. And I'm sure Elon Musk thinks he's making art. Than necessarily just a, a you know、uh, kind of, with all due respect I think he's extremely creative and he think very big and he has the power and capital to fund these things so I think they're all we're in different、um, kind of worlds in terms of thinking about the relationship and it's not so black and white and how we could position them together and、um, yeah that's. Basically, what I was thinking. I think Annette, it's a good point to come back to you. Well, I basically think we need to think about data in a broader sense because I don't think data is only quantifying things. Because if you look at different data sets, I mean, what are artists or writers doing? They create, in a sense, narratives. And so, if I talk about data, I don't mean you quantify art by numbers. I think about how can we get a, more of the information and the knowledge and the thinking behind art out there, so to give people access to that, and therefore get a better understanding. Because I do believe also. Art, because what I certainly don't like what happened in、um, New York when you get this、um, identity-driven movements, where suddenly if I say I feel comfortable with her looking at me, then we have to close this panel and we're all going to have to go home. That is not、um, a sustainable moment. I think it needs to have the debate. And the controversy among, but I would talk more about narratives in terms of data points than just numbers. 
because that doesn't tell me the value of an art piece. But if I can look at narratives that I might relate to or might not relate to, then that's, for me, a different story. So I think there's many dimensions to data, not just measuring um, what the value of a certain piece is. I think we've been talking, and I would like to go to you, Auger, about complicated ways of representing um, notional sets of ascribed value, social capital or otherwise. And can you speak a little bit about your perspective on the discussion? I think especially speaking about art as an asset class, I don't believe that the solution is getting rid of the art fairs or galleries. I mean, in contrast, I think we need good galleries who would make sure that these artworks are in good custodians in their hands. Um, for me, what's alarming is the, the changing criteria for success for artists, for um, art workers. Um, and I remember having this conversation with an artist friend of mine who is a little bit older than 70 years old, and she's an amazing artist who set up artist-run spaces, who taught at art schools, who taught at universities, and who has influenced so many practitioners, including myself. And when we were having coffee the other day, she asked me, do you think that I'm a successful artist? And for me, it's an alarming question because then it means that the, the, criterias, uh, the criteria have been focusing on a very particular data system or a very particular uh, criteria that is related to, to the sales. Um, also, I might mention that this also came up when um, we were having... Um, a conversation the other day, we are organizing a Wikipedia editathon tomorrow uh, in collaboration with M+, focusing on women artists in Asia. And during the tutorial, uh, one of the, the participants asked, what is the, the ideal format for a Wikipedia page? Um, for me, I was, it was a tough question, I have to say, because most of the good Wikipedia pages, they specify uh, why an artist is notable. And then there are the works, then there are the, the sales uh, at the auction houses or at the, the galleries. Um, but then I also brought up this example and said that it doesn't have to be about the work, education, early career, late career, collections, and then the sales. It might be about the initiatives that they founded or different types of artistic collaborations that they initiated or their teaching experience, how it has influenced so many practitioners. So I think um, one of the, the urgent discussions for me is that how do we sustain these like diversity of practices? I think that's the, the major question that I have in mind. Xiao, can I throw to you again there? Because, <laughs> Xiao, you? <laughs> Um, I did see you nodding again then as Oji oh, was speaking. I, I was just thinking about something about this idea of standardization of how we organizing knowledge because this is deeply, uh, you know, kind of into our way of existence today and everything we have a form and standard um, that, of course, is connected to power and of many years of practicing of power and how these knowledge is being organized, distributed, even, you know, to a Wikipedia page. And also that make me think a lot about museum practice and how um, knowledge information is organized in the institutional setting. It is also a form of a power that is, you know, formed over the many years of, of, of kind of a, a system, uh, systemized uh, way. Um, then I thought even bigger in terms of thinking ideas, technology, and data, because for me, um, we have a very single way, single perspective in understanding of what technology is today. And that itself is a product of globalization and standardization and synchronization that is absolutely formed with the power uh, dynamics. Um, I want to bring up a book I'm recently reading also by a beloved local philosopher now is very active in, in Europe. His name is Yue Kui. And his book is called Concerning Technology and China. And he traced the uh, birth of technology way before modern understanding to the different kind of 
virations in Asian Greece and also in China, the relationship with cosmism and how we, you know, but he is making a very strong argument in terms of thinking the future of humanity. We need to think about the verification of understanding of technology and practice of technology. And also today, I think the issue is not simply position global and local in opposition. Mm -hmm. I think local should be actively appropriating the global and then transform it into different things, which maybe we're not able to know what it is yet. Um, so these are all the things that just from the Wikipedia page um, categorization that I was thinking. I want to shift a little bit because I think that there's an important point here and I want to get to some of the things that kind of move away less about how we quantify or qualify value or demonstrate what the value of something is or the kind of, you know, polyphony of multiple perspectives. You know, the technology that we actually use the most is our phones, right? It's attached to our hands. And we spoke before about how, you know, vigilantism on the internet, a kind of, you know, an outcry of critical mass can actually alter how institutions work. There are these kinds of riptides that exist at different ends of the art world. You had an incident at the Guggenheim where decisions were made as a consequence of a movement online. And you mentioned before, should we end this panel now because you think I'm looking at you funny? So, you know, how do we actually, what is the relationship of technology to collective um, outpouring of particular positions that go unchecked in a sense, accumulatively like a tsunami of voices online? And how does that impact or affect the way that we think about the art worlds that we each work within? And that's from a range of different perspectives as an artist, as curators, as institutions connected to the market in both central and non and, you know, more localized contexts. And, you know, Fola, you had incidences in your programming where policies through government have affected the way that you've been able to work with community, and there's then that tension that exists between collective action against particular forms of agency. So it would be good, I think, to maybe go to... Um, which one of you would like to pick up the question? Can I go to you, Zhao Yu, first about the idea of what happens when an institution has to change its position on the presentation of a body of work as a consequence of a particular outcry in the online space or technological space? That's a tough question. Um, I think, actually, the museum is organizing a panel in April with uh, activists and uh, specialists on social media in uh, uh, talking about the phenomenon. Um, I can, again, speak from a personal perspective because um, I think we were all, as curators at the museum, all received individual messages and texts, uh, very vicious comments, uh, all kind of, you know, um, aggressive uh, notes in on our personal social media. And I also think it's interesting to kind of think about this neoliberal ways of existence as how we now, the, the more and more complicated relationship between individual and collectiveness and individual and institution. We're all in any, uh, every of our personal Instagram account, for example, we have to add a line that says, this is my personal opinion, doesn't represent any of the institutions. But uh, of course, these things are not so black and white and it's always interfering with each other. And how do we differentiate where to draw the line and the great zone and everything? Um, and also at the same time, the public looking at certain things as um, a collective image um, than going into individual narratives. So there's always this push and pull dynamics in the whole digital economy and how we perceive the world today. It is interesting to think about ideas of truth because it is this whole wave of fake news also um, that become really problematic um, in terms of the context of not only in the United States but everywhere. Um, and how the internet facilitate um, the generation of these fake information. I think you said something in your positioning statement at the beginning where you said you are uncertain about whether you should translate the letter, 
whether you should put yourself into the space where you would be visible as participating in a form of action or collective action and what the reprisals might be. I want to go to you, Matthew, because you live in Hong Kong and on the back of things like the umbrella movement and with the social, cultural and political changes here, you are positioning work in the public domain that challenges a dominant narrative. And you did speak to the fact that there are unspoken reprisals for people who want to make political content through things like moving image or cinema and how, you know, reprisals can be in action through a silencing or an absence of investment. How do we work in a space where we want to say something difficult or complicated when we exist within a system or structure and power that we rely upon? That was, again, a big question for you. <laughs> I keep giving you the biggest ones. <laughs> Here's to you, Matthew. <laughs> yes, you are giving me some problems that cannot be resolved, really. As an artist, when you face this issue, of course, you have things that you would like to express. There are things, there are some social problems or some correct concepts um, that you would like to express. But this may uh, be suppressed by people in power. You may be stopped by people in power. You may be stopped by in power. You may be stopped by people 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 in power. To get any support, financial support, you won't be able to get funding. In Hong Kong, as far as I know, well, in most of the cases, we have to use our own ways to raise funds. Then, in that case, the scale we can achieve will be relatively small. But at least we can say what we want to say. So I think this is rather important to an artist. Uge, coming from Istanbul to Hong Kong and coming from a context where people are actually literally being lifted and detained against their will for freedom of expression, how do you sit in relation to that space of self-censorship and what can be said and what can't be said? Another big question. <laughs> <laughs> it's um, called real talk, power, and complicity. Yeah. <laughs> I'll try to start saying a couple of words about how I try to to think about um, the internet as a platform. Maybe I could start that, and then we can move to mm. self censorship. Um, because there are two um, kind of extreme examples that come to my mind. The, the first one would be the, the suffix uh, dot art. Uh, that is now administered by a for-profit company, and uh, it's Eflux that is advising this company, for instance. And I'm curious what type of um, monopolies we are creating with those um, suffixes, because I remember reading a press release coming from ICA in London, and they adopted the, the suffix last year, and they were saying that we are much more interested in becoming a global institution, and we don't want to, to stay related to, to the, this rising nationalism within the UK. So when you think about that statement, of course, uh, there is a kind of a positive enforcement coming with these more, let's say, global discourses. But I think I still have my um, question marks in my mind. Um, the other example would be obviously Asia Art Archive uh, and how we think about resources. Because when we first uh, initiated the organization, it was a bunch of books, basically. And it has grown into a very big library, comprehensive library. But then a couple of, let's say, eight years ago, we started digitizing. And... Um, because when you think about creating a resource, you can create a beautiful physical space where people can come, they can hang out, they can read books, they can check out the, the resources. But there's also an urgent need to decentralize these things. So how do we make sure that we make the, the resources that we have available to, to larger communities? And how do we, again, think about that sense of ownership or sense of belonging that can go beyond the, the cities in which we operate in? I think these are the first two examples that come to my mind. And in terms of censorship, um, that's a difficult one. I should say that um, there's a tendency for polarization, and that's uh, visible in the politics in every part of the world, that's visible on social media. Um, and for me, what's important to, to emphasize is that uh, we do 
self-censorship on a daily basis every moment. So these um, freedom of expression or artistic freedom of expression, I don't necessarily believe that it's a given right or an absolute right, but these would be, um, how should I put it? For instance, what's tolerable, what's intolerable, uh, what's scandalous, what's outrageous. The definitions of these terms or what constitutes a crime, the definitions change on a daily basis. It changes from day to day, from month to month, from year to year, from decade to decade. So what's important is to, for me is to improve the conditions of debate about those things. Um, if I can summarize it, that would be the sentence that I would use. Annette, did you, you just looked at me, I think, to say something to that. Well, I think there's a bigger, more societal issue behind that, that we kind of lost the collective. And I remember reading a book that must be 15 years ago that was a U.S. author, I forgot the name, but the book was called The Big Sort which basically meant people were moving in areas where people were very similar to them. So nothing is disturbing when all my neighbors have the same p political opinion, pretty much the same amount of income, pretty much the same interests, pretty much etc., etc. And I think that has been, and I, for me, that is the biggest threat not only to democracy, but to human life on this planet, because I think the what happened at the Guggenheim is basically one example when people lose the sense for collective beyond themselves and take their own small interest more of more relevance than anything else and because of the internet, they then get the perceived power of there's something big and they don't realize that there might be a huge silent majority that might have a different opinion, might have different interests, and that we somehow in the world need to come. And I do think that art can play a role in that. How do we get that collective, those gazillion amounts of perspectives back into the spectrum in the sense of it is something positive and not something negative and threatening. I think, Fola, that, you know, I, would, I think there's a perspective on this which could be added by you at this point in a very immediate way. With the Lagos Biennial, you chose to work with a community of people who suffer social inequity at a very profound level. And through putting the title biennial on top of anything, sometimes you put a target on your back. And, you know, when the government became aware of what you were doing, they sought to move the community on that you were working with. So how do you work in that space to think about what is permissible? You know, we, as Annette talks about these sorts of echo chambers that we exist within, we think what we're doing is okay because it's reaffirmed by the voices around us. But how do you actually work when the state are so high? I think for me what's most important is um, the idea that the artist is expressing and for the sake of um, art structures I wouldn't take away that right or that artistic freedom and whatever the reverb or the repercussion is I think is, is part of the process and it's part of life so if, um, if an artist wants to say something or do something that is offensive to another person or another party, um, it only states who the artist is. The, the, the piece of art is, is a window into the mind of, of you know, the artist. So I don't think that sort of censorship, I, th I think it diminishes the art. Yeah. Do we have any questions from the audience at all at this point? Can I see if anyone wants to raise a hand? I don't think I see any questions out there. But if you do, then please let me know. But I would like to go to that. And actually, Matthew, you know, to get some of your impressions at this point, really about what the stakes... 
put my headphone back on. <laughs> but what the stakes are, again, in terms of, I don't know, something quite different, that sort of echo chamber, that sort of reverbs. I want to break that down a little bit more about how we break out of that echo chamber that kind of reflects back to us a reality that we perceive as our own and how we actually begin to break into something much more kind of dynamic. Again, a big question. <laughs> Um, I think whatever you do, even beyond art, whatever you do, your action, what you say, someone may have different views, right? It's the same for the artist. You may have one piece of work, you do something, that is your view, that is your perspective, that is how you communicate. Of course, there will always be people who want to attack you, they don't like what you do, but if you are being genuine, you are telling something from the bottom of your heart, you have that entitlement, you have the right to say it. What is the role of institutions when good intentions go awry? You know, when things don't go as planned. How can we... What was that? Stand up. Stand up? Yeah. 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 Is it, I mean, I personally was very shocked. Of, I can totally understand why the Guggenheim, due to the really, really personal and apparently very severe threats to the employees, reacted like they did. But I still think that is... We should not react like that. We need to stand up against those movement and say, because where does it end? You know, where does it end if we start to um, react to those, let's call them the identity based movements that people have certain small topics that then they aim to push onto entire societies and I think once we start stopping to push back then it's difficult even so I thought it was marvelous how the organization dealt with it um, because the art piece was still there and there was people around it who explained to you <laughs> what you're not seeing so I thought that was an interesting thing but I think it was a moment where something opened which I believe it's very dangerous. It's an interesting one because it's a fine line again, right? Yes. It's sort of like codes of conduct around sexual harassment or bullying. And again, it's about holding institutions to account. At what point is a particular agenda being wedged by a group or collective of individuals, which is not to, in a sense, is in a sense to the effect of shutting down the capacity for freedom of expression, which is not about vilifying anyone's position, and in this case, the existence of work that came from a particular context. But then I think about the flip side, people like Walid Rod or people like Guy Manus Abbott and the campaign that they created, um, the, that they waged in relationship to the building of the Louvre in, you know, in Dubai and in the Emirates and in the relationship to migrant labor and the inequitable pay conditions that migrant workers were enduring in the service of building large-scale mega museums, you know, in particular areas of certain wealth and power. So, you know, at what point is the collective action of a group of people to shut one thing down? How do we determine one way or the other which one? And we say before that there is no such thing as the binary of what's right or wrong. But how do we actually begin to negotiate a nomenclature that can identify or provide a space for people to create a distinct set of actions that can affect profound social change that is necessary in the culture of an institution? And that's, that's a question that I'd like to put to whoever would like to pick that up. You, would you like to pick it up for me? <laughs> I wanted to add to this as a question, maybe even to you, um, about, how, like, it's an interesting panel and the kinds of ideas that have come up and uh, responses to some of your questions. In today's time, how does one situate power? Because on the one hand, there's the power of money and who has it and who has the power to mobilize all that money. Then there's the institution. Then there's the increasing apparentness of populism and social media and technology and so the people are empowered but of course we all know where powerlessness is also distributed so there's this condition where 
as Foucault used to describe it, a capillary sort of distribution of power. And when, when, when one is in, within that, then what exactly are we speaking about when we're speaking about power? Because we're speaking about everything. Yeah. And so, um, what's the debate? <laughs> if, you know, like, yeah. because then the structures of knowledge, I mean, knowledge, power, all of these things have been discussed time and again. So either we need to then talk about maybe structures of ignorance. What are we not being able to talk about? Not because they're censored, but because they're not apparent. Otherwise, power is apparent through everything at the moment, is, even as the panel laid itself out. So what are we not able to see? Not what is being censored, necessarily. And what are also, I think, and that's another interesting thing, what are, what, what are we trying to conceal? Because this whole the censorship and everything is about something's been kept hidden from expressing itself, or something has been made to conceal itself. But a lot of times, in order for a struggle to happen, you want sometimes anonymity, you want sometimes a certain kind of concealment or a stealth behavior, which, in fact, positions of power operate very well with stealthness rather than... And so did the Gorilla Girls. <laughs> what was that last bit? So did the Gorilla Girls, yeah. and maintaining anonymity and things like that. So, so I mean, long story short, it, po capillary, power, we're talking about everything. And at the same time, so yeah, how, and it's a question, but also almost a rhetorical one. Where do we even situate power when we're talking about power right now? Because it's we're talking about everything. I think it's such a diverse panel in terms of their particular positions that they occupy that finding one singular definition, and that was the point with the kind of positioning statements at the outset, was to try and identify. But it is an interesting panel in a sense because we operate across a breadth of a range of such particularly localized but also larger specificities that that power is an amorphous thing. I think from the perspective of the panel, the power when this panel was set up that Stephanie and I were talking about was a kind of endemic pathology of kind of systemic structures of power that actually seek to subjugate the ability for more discursive forms to emerge through institutions. That's both within and outside. And by that, I mean, you know, we talk about socially engaged or politically oriented practices. We write press releases. We congratulate ourselves and pat ourselves on the back for the good work we do engaging with communities. But back of house, we're yelling at the person who did the photocopying or we're sexually harassing the intern who's getting the coffee. Or we actually have these hierarchies and systems of power that exist within institutions in contexts like folders where two or three people hold the power or in a context like Hong Kong where only a handful of artists can actually represent an entire community. Or in the circumstances, someone like, you know, Zhao Yu, where she is called upon to represent a country in terms of advocating to an institution that sees itself as a kind of an embodiment of a particular canonical knowledge. So I think from the definition of the panel, but from the panel itself, could you each respond in your own way to the question that was raised? I think you raised an extremely relevant point. And I do think you also raised somehow the answer, because if power is everywhere, that means that everybody has a piece of that power. And I personally believe that the only way or probably the most effective way to um, work with that power everywhere is to have agile organizations who can adopt. Those are usually small, which means you delegate to the bottom. Mm. Because we humans... When I know you, and I know that I'm working with you, then it's a very different relation than when I work with this vast room filled with people who half of them I've never seen, have no relation with, and then it's very different. So I think you gave the answer in a way by positioning it that power is everywhere which I do think you can see in many areas. I mean, big companies are realizing that these big monolithic structures do not work efficiently anymore and they're trying to break it down. And you can see that communities who kind of delegate to the bottom and kind of engage or try to engage everybody or allow everybody to engage themselves 
also have a very different engagement factor, meaning that people feel more responsible for wherever they are. Does anybody else on the panel have any final thoughts on that? Um, maybe, maybe I may add something. When you were raising the question, I was actually thinking of uh, visibility and invisibility in relation to, to censorship. Because, for instance, I'm a Turkish citizen, so if most of the, in most of the conversations, people would always ask me, so what do you think about censorship in Turkey? Because it's so visible. Um, whereas we are not that able to speak about censorship in places uh, like Central Europe, where there are certain structures that support production of artworks. So when there are political influences that become part of the decision-making, it really happens behind the, the closed doors. So visibility sometimes, it's something that we can use. So for me, I, um, I'd like to see that, I know it's going to sound a little bit strange, but I'd like to see that visibility as uh, an opportunity. Sometimes we cannot really act on these because of the political situation, but we are able to document these cases. We are able to analyze. We are able to, to, to draw more structural questions around those um, incidences. Um, and what, when that happens, I think, again, the, the crux of the question is um, how do we get rid of the, the spinary positions of being a victim versus perpetrator of censorship? And again, how do we improve the conditions of debate again? Um, visibility is a good, a good thing, I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Anyone? Just a yes. small thing. I was also sorry. Um, I was also thinking about a scholar friend of mine who works about artistic freedom of expression, both in Germany and in Turkey. She is not able to to publish her paper in Germany, but for Turkey, she keeps repeating. She keeps receiving these requests about, you know, why don't you write about it more? Why don't you write for this journal, this magazine, this map, this newspaper? So, but these structural things, it's good that they are visible. It's good that censorship happens when the artwork meets the public so that we can talk about it. Anyone else? Or I think that was a great place to finish and I think for what you said would might be a rhetorical question, that was actually a great answer. So, look, let's have a round of applause to the panellists. <laughs>